We have three texts this morning. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, except the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? And then verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. And then Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? I dare say, apart from the fact that Ezekiel has those three verses in his prophecy, that the entire book of Ezekiel would be of very little interest at all to most professing Christians today. In fact, Ezekiel would not make it into the top ten of the favorite biblical books of most Christians. Ezekiel is a long and difficult book, one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. And he is an exilic prophet, which means he prophesied during the Babylonian captivity or exile. We have prophets before the exile, we have prophets during the exile, such as Ezekiel and Daniel, and we have prophets after the exile, such as Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And Ezekiel himself was taken captive, and he lived among the captives in Babylon, beside the river. That's where he got his first vision, the famous vision of Ezekiel chapter 1. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, had come against what was left of the people of God. Judah and Benjamin and the city of Jerusalem in particular and he had come in several waves. The first time he came he took away the royal princes. That was when Daniel was taken captive. The second time he came he took away more of the more important people and that was when Ezekiel was taken captive. And the third time he came he came in all of his vengeance and fury and utterly destroyed the city of Jerusalem, including the temple. And Ezekiel prophesies during that period. He prophesies between those two events. And the first part of his prophecy is before the final fall of Jerusalem. And so the people of God to whom Ezekiel is prophesying are fluctuating between hope and despair. They hope in their heart of hearts that God will not carry out his threat to destroy Jerusalem. And they hope that soon they will be able to return to their homeland. But God has warned them it will be a long period of time 70 years. That's what Jeremiah has said. In the earlier part of the book, Ezekiel is concerned with impressing upon the people their sins because they are largely in denial concerning their sins and they are largely impenitent concerning their sins. In the second part of the book, after the fall of Jerusalem, Ezekiel is interested more in giving the people hope. And so he gives this grand vision of the future restoration of Israel. And so Ezekiel is called to prophesy at a very important period in Israel's history. And in chapter 18, the people are complaining. And they have a proverb which explains their complaint. You read that proverb 
in verse 2. So fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, it is not fair that we, the children of those idolaters, must suffer now in Babylon. We are suffering for the sins of our fathers. And Ezekiel points out to the people that's not the case at all. Yes, the sins of the fathers certainly had a role to play, but these people are suffering in Babylon because of their own sins. And he illustrates this with a few case studies. You see that in chapter 18. He talks about a man who is a godly man, describes in great detail the godliness of this man, and says, he will live. Then he talks about a man who is born to that godly man who is a wicked man, describes his wickedness in great detail, says, he will die. He will not live because of the godliness of his father. Then he talks about the grandson. And he goes back to godliness. He sees the bad example that his father had shown him. And he fears God and he repents. And then Ezekiel says about him, he will live. And so it's not the case that the sons must bear the sins of the fathers. Each person, says Ezekiel, will die because of his or her own sins. And in both of these chapters, chapters 18 and 33, Jehovah makes a similar declaration, which is that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And he makes the same call of repentance. Turn ye from your evil ways. And the attitude of the people in both of these chapters is basically the same. There is no point, they say, there is no point in turning from our evil ways. There is no point in repenting. There is no point in seeking Jehovah's face. Because whatever we do, we're going to die anyway. In chapter 18 they're saying, it doesn't matter whether you live righteously or wickedly because we are suffering the consequences of our fathers sins and hence the proverb which God says he will destroy out of the mouth of his people verse 3 as I live saith the Lord God ye shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel and so the conclusion of the people is God is unfair God's ways are not equal they do not measure up to our understanding of what justice should be. In chapter 33, Jerusalem has finally fallen. 33, verse 21. And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. And so all the hope that the people had is gone, it is dashed. Ezekiel had prophesied that this would happen. He warned them that God was departing from Jerusalem. But they didn't believe him. They said, no, God will surely have mercy upon his holy city and upon the house of God which is in Jerusalem. But now it's fallen and their attitude is different. No longer are they saying that God is not fair, but now they're saying that God has no mercy left. They lament in Ezekiel 33 verse 10. If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall we then live? That is a confession of hopelessness. Our sins are upon us. Our transgressions are upon us. We're going to rot. We're going to die in our sins. We're doomed. God has no more mercy upon his people. God has finally broken his covenant promise. Christ 
cannot come. There's no hope. And therefore, there's no point in repenting of our sins. We might as well just live like the Babylonians and die in our sins. And in both Ezekiel 18 and 33, the prophet is called to bring a message of hope. There is salvation for those who turn. There is salvation for those who are wicked, no matter how wicked they may have been in the past, for those who turn. Therefore, says Ezekiel, be assured of this, that in the way of turning, you will live, you will not die. Notice then, Jehovah's pleasure in the turning of the wicked. Jehovah's pleasure in the turning of the wicked. Notice first the pleasure of Jehovah, then the call to turn, and finally the promise of life. These three verses, among evangelicals, probably the most famous verses in all of Ezekiel, speak three times about God's pleasure. Have I any pleasure? Verse 23. I have no pleasure, verse 32, and again in chapter 33, 11, I have no pleasure. And this statement, these three statements together, this is unique to the prophet Ezekiel. And the prophet is keen to underline this truth for deeply pastoral reasons. And so he stresses it with significant language. Three times he says the same thing in three different ways. The first one is a rhetorical question. Have I any pleasure? A rhetorical question, you understand, is not like an ordinary question where you ask something in order to receive information. Where is the bank? That is not a rhetorical question. You want to know where the bank is. But a rhetorical question is one where the answer is already obvious in the question. And it is used for effect. Because a rhetorical question is more effective than a simple statement. Here, for example, is Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom Shall I fear? That's a rhetorical question. He could have said, I fear no one. But whom shall I fear is more effective than saying, I fear no one. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Second, we have in verse 32 an emphatic negative statement. I have no pleasure. Literally, not, I have pleasure. And third, in chapter 33, we have an oath. God swears. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure. An emphatic negative statement is strong. A rhetorical question is even stronger. But even stronger yet is an oath. Because in the oath, God swears. And God says effectively this, If this is not true, I am not God. If this is not true, I am not the living God. I would rather die than this not be true. And so God, being God, swears by himself. As I live because there's nothing higher and no one higher by which God could swear. Moreover, the Hebrew language underlines this and emphasizes this, especially in verse 23. Literally, verse 23 says, Having pleasure, have I pleasure. That's the same kind of language as God used in the garden where he said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Literally, the Hebrew is, dying, thou shalt die. 
And that's how Hebrew makes something uh. emphatic. And so he says, surely, emphatically, absolutely, I have no pleasure, do I? That's the idea of verse 23. Or as our authorized version puts it, have I any pleasure at all? Any pleasure at all? Now we have to ask the question, what does it mean for God to have pleasure? What is this pleasure? God's pleasure is first in the Bible, that which he is pleased to do, that which seems good to him to decree and to execute for his own glory. Psalm 115 verse 3, But our God is in the heavens, he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Psalm 135 verse 6, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he. And so on. Jesus speaks of this in Luke 10, 21. For so it seemed good in thy sight, for it was according to thy good pleasure. And there, Jesus speaks about the fact that it is good for God. It seems good to him. He is pleased to hide the truth from the wise and prudent and reveal it unto me. And then Philippians 2.13 speaks about God working in us his good pleasure. Second, God's pleasure is that in which he delights or that which is pleasing in his sight. Third, God's pleasure is that of which he approves in his creatures. And God has pleasure and approves of righteousness, obedience, and repentance, and thus he commands righteousness, obedience, and repentance. And fourth, God's pleasure is that which he desires or wills to happen, or wills others to do. And so Ezekiel says in these texts that God is pleased to decree or execute something, he takes pleasure in something, he delights in something, he approves of something according to this prophecy. Now what is it? Negatively, God declares emphatically, even by means of an emphatic rhetorical question, and he swears with an oath that he does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, or in the death of him that dieth. Positively, God declares with all the rhetorical flourishes with which the Hebrew language is possible, that he does take pleasure in the turning and the subsequent life of the wicked. And not that he should return from his ways and live, verse 23, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, chapter 33, verse 11. So, this means God has decreed that the wicked shall not die, but shall return from his way and live. God takes pleasure in the wicked who does not die, but rather turns from his way and lives. God delights in the non-dying, but turning, and the living of the wicked and the turning of the wicked from his sins and his living before God in righteousness is something of which God approves. And the turning of the wicked from his sins and his living before God is something which God wills or desires. And because of that, the call goes out to the wicked. Repent and turn yourselves. Verse 30, chapter 18. Cast away from you all your transgressions. Verse 31. Why will ye die, O house of Israel? Verse 31. Wherefore turn yourselves and live ye? Verse 32. Now the interpretation of these three texts by all Arminians, and sadly by many Calvinists today, 
is that God here desires the turning and salvation of all wicked men and women without exception. And they interpret it this way. God does not have pleasure in the death of any impenitent wicked person at all. Or as the Good News Bible translates verse 32, I do not want anyone to die. That's how the Good News Bible translates verse 32. And I remind you, that's an oath. This is the teaching common among evangelicals and even among Calvinists that God wants to save everybody. The Arminians, of course, do not believe in election or reprobation. They do not believe that God before the foundation of the world has chosen to save some and has rejected others. They believe that God has made salvation possible for everyone because God really and sincerely loves everyone. God earnestly desires that every single person on the earth be in heaven, but most, or at least many, do not get to heaven because of a wrong use of their free will. And then God reluctantly on his part sends such wicked people to hell because God respects their free will more than he really desires to save them. And thus Arminians teach an utterly disappointed and defeated God. Because every time a wicked person dies in his sins and goes to hell, and this happens, remember, countless times every day, God is sad. God must be sad. Because God, remember, earnestly desires the salvation of all men. And if God is sad over one sinner who perishes, how sad must God be on the last day over all the multitudes of sinners who must perish? And therefore, God must be the most miserable being imaginable. That's the logical conclusion of Arminianism. But Calvinists, many of them today, use these three verses to teach that there is a sense in which God earnestly and sincerely desires and longs for the salvation of all men, including those he has not chosen to save before the foundation of the world, that is to say, the reprobate wicked. That's the teaching of the well-men offer of the gospel or the free offer of the gospel. They would say, yes, God chose only some in eternity and rejected the rest. And yes, Christ only died for some and Christ didn't die for the rest. But, for all of that, they would say, God comes to every man who hears the gospel and says to him, I take no pleasure in your death. I want you to live. I sincerely desire that you live. And if you say to such a Calvinist that that makes God to be a changeable, confused, conflicted being, who on the one hand desires the salvation of all without exception, but on the other hand has eternally determined within himself not to save all men, they will say, but it's a mystery. You must accept both. Otherwise you are imposing your own logic, your own human logic upon God and his word. And then they'll take out those two nasty names. You are a hyper-Calvinist. And you are a rationalist. You go beyond the doctrines of Calvinism and you enthrone human reason above the Bible. And then they will say about God, but God, you understand, is a very complicated and complex being. 
and he has very many conflicting emotions. His emotions are very complicated. And we add, we say to that, no, no, the Bible teaches that God is one. That God is actually a perfectly simple, undivided being. And that's what our Belgian Confession tells us in Article 1. We believe in one simple being called God. And we say, what God wills happens, including the death of the impenitent, reprobate, wicked. That's what Psalm 115 verse 3 says. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says, I will do all my pleasure. Not just some of my pleasure, but all of my pleasure. But Ezekiel is not saying in his prophecy that God does not desire the death of any wicked. Read Ezekiel in his context, and you will see that Ezekiel has certain particular wicked in mind. Not every single human being without exception. To take Ezekiel here in chapter 18 and 33 and then to apply it to all wicked who have ever lived in the history of the world and then say about all the wicked that God does not desire that any of them should perish is to read into Ezekiel something that is not there. And to make Ezekiel say something which he never meant to say. Remember who Ezekiel is. He is a prophet to Israel. Now in chapters 25 to 32, the chapters just before chapter 33, Ezekiel has prophesied death and destruction upon the nations of Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre and Sidon, and Egypt. So after doing all of that, do you really believe that Ezekiel is now saying about all of the wicked in Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt that God does not have any pleasure in their death? Did God send a prophet to any of these nations to declare to them God's well-meaning desire to save them from their sins? And what about the great nation of the Babylonians? Did God have any pleasure in the death of the Babylonians? We sang a few moments ago, Psalm 137, where the church is called to sing about the death of the little babies of the Babylonians. And in the passage itself, we can see that Ezekiel has in mind not all men without exception, not all the wicked in all the world, but the wicked who are in Israel, which is the Old Testament church of Jesus Christ. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked in the church. Twice he says, Why will ye die, O house of Israel? So these passages do not teach, and Ezekiel certainly did not intend them to teach, that God sincerely, earnestly desires the salvation of all of the wicked today. We have no warrant to go out into the world and say to every wicked person we meet, God has no pleasure in your death. God earnestly desires that you be saved. Multitudes today have never heard the gospel and most likely never will hear the gospel. And of those who do hear the gospel, God does not work faith in all of their hearts. It would be foolish to suggest that God has no pleasure in the death of any wicked person. Besides, Ezekiel qualifies who the wicked are in whose death he takes no pleasure. They are the turning wicked. The wicked who turn. Ezekiel 18.23 Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, 
and not that he should return from his ways and live. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that, he, that, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God does not say, and we have no right to read into the text what God does not say, that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked who do not turn. God does not say that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, whether the wicked turn or not. But God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked who turn, and he proves that by giving unto them life, as we shall see. Now I turn to 1 Samuel 2.25. Here God speaks about the wicked sons of Eli called Hophni and Phinehas. This is what the Word of God says. Notwithstanding, they, the two wicked sons, hearkened not unto the voice of their father Eli, because the Lord would slay them. That phrase, would slay, is the same Hebrew as take pleasure in Ezekiel. And so I could translate it this way. But they did not listen to their father's voice because the Lord delighted to kill them, or the Lord took pleasure in killing them, or the Lord was determined and willed to kill them. God most certainly did take pleasure and delight in the death of Hophni and Phinehas. They were wicked men. They did not turn from their sins. And God punished them. And in punishing them, he showed his own justice in which God delights. But Ezekiel has nothing to do with the universal love of God, a universal desire of God, or a universal offer of salvation from God. Now, since God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked who turn, the call goes out from Ezekiel, and the call goes out to us this morning too, turn ye, turn ye from your sins. Because, says Ezekiel, there is no blessing to be experienced from God as long as we walk in our sins and refuse to turn from them. God does not promise that the wicked who do not turn shall live, but he does promise that all those who do turn shall live, because turning or repentance or conversion is something in which God delights, it is something which he commands, it is something of which he approves. Unbelief on the other hand, and refusal to turn are things which God abhors, things which he does not approve of, things which he forbids. God will bless and save the one who turns, no matter how wicked he may have been in the past, and God will curse and condemn the wicked man who does not turn. And so in Ezekiel's audience, as in all audiences when the gospel is preached, there are two kinds of wicked person. There are the wicked who turn in sincere sorrow over their sins to God. And to those wicked, God says, I take no pleasure in your death. I promise unto you blessings and salvation in the way of your turning from your sins. But then there are also the wicked who do not turn. And to those wicked, God does not say, I take no pleasure in your death, but rather God threatens judgment upon them, and he destroys them in the way of their impenitence. Because remember, all of us are wicked. We might think, oh, we are the children of God. We are surely the righteous. And that's true. In certain passages of Scripture, we are described as the righteous. But here, Ezekiel is talking to a mixed group of people and calls them, all of them, the wicked. 
and some of the wicked turn, and they're blessed, and they're seated, and other wicked do not turn, but are destroyed. They're wicked because, because all of them by nature are the same. All of them are by nature rebels against heaven. All of them are by nature self-willed and proud. All of them, us included this morning, say by nature to God, we will not have God rule over us. We will not have God tell us how we must live. We will live according to our own desires and our own fancies. And God will not determine for us how we should walk before him. And every time we sin, we say that to God. And these two kinds of wicked people in the audience look exactly the same for a while until the gospel comes to them and the power of God's grace changes some of them and turns them. One hears the call, turn ye, turn ye, and he turns. By God's grace, he turns and he lives. The other hears the call, turn ye, turn ye, and he refuses to turn, and he perishes. And so Ezekiel calls to conversion and repentance, those who are walking in sin. He calls them not only to give up a few habits in their life, but calls them to a complete change, a spiritual turning. Before they hated God, now they must love God. Before they loved sin, now they must hate sin and be ashamed of sin and be sorry. Because they understand that their sin is sin against God. This involves a new way Casting away all of our transgressions, making a new heart and a new spirit, turning from our evil ways. And so you see that Ezekiel here is not teaching that God wants to save everybody. That is completely foreign to his purpose. Nothing whatsoever to do with his message. His message was for the people who were sitting before him in chapter 18 and chapter 33 and it was encouragement to them to repent of their sins it was encouragement in particular to god's elect people who had begun to feel the burden of their sins who had now begun to say our sins and our transgressions are upon us and we pine away in them and they needed that encouragement put yourself in the shoes of Ezekiel's audience they were saying and their companions were saying to them as well there is no hope God has abandoned us there's no point in turning God has finished with us we might as well not bother and the devil said the same thing to them. God will not forgive you. You have sinned too much. God is angry with you. Do not even think of repenting of your sins. It's too late. You might have done it years ago before the temple was destroyed, but now it's too late. And the answer of the prophet is to tell them three times, in three different ways, in an emphatic way, that God does not take pleasure or delight in the death of the wicked man who turns. For the wicked man who turns, no matter how wicked he may have been, there is mercy. God declares it. God swears it with an oath. And this is a powerful incentive to come to Jehovah God. There is promise, a sweet promise to every penitent soul. Life. Life. And as proof that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked who turns, God promises life to the wicked 
returns. And that life is not automatic. It's not that you turn from your sins and that earns for you eternal life. That promise that Ezekiel gives here from God, that oath which Ezekiel declares from God, cost God something. It cost God his own son. Because if you turn away from your sins, let's say you lead an awfully wicked life, and then you turn away from your sins and you start living a godly life instead, that does not blot out all of your previous transgressions so that God can say to you, I remember your sins and iniquities no more. Those sins have to be paid for. And even the sins in which you're walking today have to be paid for. And so there has to be something behind the promise of God. There has to be something behind that oath. Which is why the well men offer is basically meaningless. Because God comes to those who are the reprobate according to the well men offer and swears to them with an oath that he has no pleasure in their death. That he has salvation for them. He wants to offer salvation to them. But he has no salvation for them. Because Christ did not die for them. How can he offer salvation for them if Christ has not purchased that salvation for them? And so God makes this promise, not an offer, but a promise. In the way of your turning, you shall receive life. And you shall receive life because my son has died in that perspective will die on the cross for your sins. Because Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, it pleased, there's the same word again, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And on the basis of that, the work of Christ, God can make this solemn oath an oath which is so serious and so binding that it means this, as I live, if I have no life for the wicked who turn, then I am not God. If the wicked turn to me from their sin and find no life in me, I am not the living God. But says Ezekiel, there is life for the wicked. Not for all the wicked, those who don't turn as well as those who do turn. But only for the wicked who turn. And they're the wicked whom God loves. And they're the wicked whom God shows before the foundation of the world. And they're the wicked for whom Christ died. And so God graciously forgives the wicked in the house of Israel. And God graciously forgives us as well. And God promises graciously to forgive the penitent. And no penitent sinner who is sorry for his sins should fear to come to God for salvation, therefore. God swears he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked who turns. So don't say to yourself this morning, my sins are too great. I have walked in terrible sins this past week. Perhaps I might even be a reprobate person. God does not call us to say how terrible my sins are and then wallow in them in misery, but God calls us to turn. To turn. But God says, in the way of turning, you will not die. You will live. You will live because Christ died for you and rose again for you. God swears it to you, return. And God cannot lie. So turn. Turn from your wicked ways and live. Amen. Praise.
Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy gracious promise that those who turn shall live. We pray we might turn daily to thee from our sins and receive that forgiveness from thee, which is purchased for us in the cross of Christ. Amen.